I'm going to record on this computer also. So we're recording. So we'll start with prayer. Gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we come to you today to get our minds back into your word and our time together is so precious. We thank you, Father, for this technology that allows us from far reaches of this country to be able to come together in this manner and to discuss um, not as, as openly sometimes as we have in person, obviously, because just the, there are some limitations, but otherwise we do definitely want to participate, to talk, and to um, come together in one mind through your Holy Spirit as to what it is that you would have us learn from this. And also, it's an awesome story. It's a very sweet story. But Father, it needs to be much more than that. And we ask that you'll take it and apply it to our lives and our hearts. And in any way that we need to change or be comforted, uh, we ask for that as well. We ask for your discernment, your wisdom, your knowledge. Um, and we know that when we ask for those things with the right intentions, that you will definitely give us those things. You've promised it. So we just thank you in advance. Just ask that you'll guide our discussion today. Keep us on track and keep us on time. And we ask you for it all and thank you for it all in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So um, this, so we're going to just set some, um, some things that we can know about Ruth. Um, this is an Old Testament book, but what type of literature is it? It's always important to approach any of these knowing what, are we studying? What type of literature? I can give you some options. Um, is it history? Is it prophecy? Is it poetry? Is it an epistle? History. It's history, right. So anytime we have history, sometimes we take it and say it's his story, God's story, but it is a story. So it, it, it unfolds for us and it plays out like a story. Sometimes that makes it easier to read. A lot of the Old Testament can be easier to read for that very reason, because it is a story. And this is a beautiful one. So when you approach any book, like if you're approaching things in poetry, you'd have to always remember that there's a lot of symbolism and a lot of allegory and a lot of comparisons and all. Whereas when you're reading history, you're basically just reading a true, in this case, a very true accounting of, um, of the events and how they happen. And as, um, as the New Testament tells us, everything that was written was written for our instruction, not just the Jewish people's instruction. It was written for our instruction. God has preserved this for us to know and for us to understand and for us to read, even though some of it is extremely foreign to us. It's not the way we think. And that doesn't mean that this applies to us directly and that we're supposed to go and do some of these things all the time, but it does mean that there are principles and that there are practical things that we can learn from it and we can, um, that God has for us to learn. So, um, and there is just a lot in this small four chapter book that we will take from that. So again, what type of literature is important? It is a book of history. Um, but we also want to set the context. So the context of Ruth in the overall scheme of the timeline of history, where does Ruth fall? What would you call it in the time of the judges? judges right? If you flip back a page in your Bible, you have a whole book called the book of Judges. Um, it fits in there. It's not after the, the times of the judges. In other words, it is after in the, the uh, order of books in the Bible, but it is not after it in time. Okay. Um, some of the other ways to put this into context is even on the last day, you looked up in the book of Joshua, um, which comes before Judges. <laughs> okay, so let's just think about the history timeline of the Bible up to up to and past even this time. If we want to get a really broad view of context, we've got creation, we've got the flood, later we've got the uh, establishment of the nation of Israel through starting with Abraham and through the 12 tribes of Israel. We have them going into captivity 
in, in uh, Egypt, and then we have them coming out of captivity in the book of Exodus and wandering in the wilderness, and then they go into the land. They go into the land by whose leadership? Joshua. Somebody about said it. Joshua. Joshua, right. So coming to closer to this time, we've got the book of Joshua. In the book of Joshua, um, the first city they encounter and the first city they conquer once they crossed over into the land is what? Joshua and the battle of, Joshua and the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. <laughs> Sometimes songs are very helpful. Okay, who helped the Israelites in Jericho, when the two spies were sent to Jericho to spy it out, what was the woman's name? Do you know? Rahab. Rahab. What was she called? What was she by trade? A harlot. Yeah. Rahab. The harlot. Okay. So you have Rahab the harlot in the time of Joshua, in the time that they first come into the land, in the story of the Battle of Jericho, um, she's, she's prominent. Of all the people in Jericho, the only ones that are preserved and not destroyed are Rahab and whoever came into her house. And that would be family mainly, but they would be preserved if they believed what she told them, believed like she believed, and acted on that belief. Okay, so then the Israelites took her and her family and were instructed to take them and leave them outside the camp just long enough for them to be cleansed and then they were brought into the camp. And as a result, Rahab, someone married Rahab, right? Who married Rahab? Do you remember? He looked it up on day five. Salmon, is that his name? Is it spelled that way? Am I right about the spelling? Yeah, okay. So you have an Israelite who married this woman from Jericho. She's a Canaanite. She's not an Israelite. She marries, she, this, and this is a sanctioned married, marriage by God. Why is this important? Because in our timeline, to get us to Ruth, you've got... This is in the time of Joshua. The next time frame is in the time of the judges, right? And the book of Ruth, the story of Ruth, falls during this time period, the time of the judges. Then you've got the time of the kings after the time of the judges. We've got the first king is Saul, but who is from the tribe of Judah? And who does God establish the line through, the king, king's line through? Which king? Who did he make the promise to and make the covenant with? Do you remember? The second king, who is David. David is of the tribe of Judah. Saul was not. Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin. If you go all the way back to prior to Rahab, to the time of the Exodus, or even prior to that, sorry, you've got in the very end of Genesis, you've got the blessings of, um, of Israel or Jacob on his sons. And in that, you see that the scepter is in Judah, the scepter in the blessing is for the son whose name was Judah, and therefore the kings are coming through the line of Judah. So Saul was king, God orchestrated that, but that was not who he established the Israelite kingdom through, the world of kingdom through. That was through David. And with David, he made what's called the Davidic covenant. And that covenant included that there would be someone who was capable of sitting on the throne forever. David's line would be preserved, okay? Why is David's line important? Who comes from David's line, ultimately? Jesus. Jesus, right. So ultimately, we get to Jesus. So 
this is not like Jesus was right after the time of the Kings, but still um, he's after the time of the Kings. So this is important to kind of go back and figure out who and what, but also we've got Rahab the harlot, who is a Canaanite, and we have Ruth, and what is her nationality? Moab. She is from Moab. She's a Moabite. Okay, two women who are in the genetic makeup, genealogy of Christ that are not Israelites. Very significant. Rahab obviously had a Rahab the harlot. That's not a good thing. <laughs> but she still acted on faith. God rewarded that. And she is in the line. It's awesome. The If you look at the genealogy of Christ in um, here and at the, at the final part of Ruth, but also in, I think it's the book of Matthew, you see that who, what is the son of Rahab and Salmon? I'm trying to think of the son of Rahab and Salmon. Um, oh, yeah, it's Boaz. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So their, their resulting son is Boaz. Now, if you looked at any commentaries, and I don't think we were actually told to do this, um, you may already know that there are, are scholars that believe that there are missing generations between Salmon and Boaz, um, but we don't know that. So if, if Rahab and Salmon are in the days of the judges, and Ruth is in the days of, sorry, in the days of, they're in the days of Joshua, and Ruth is in the day of the judges, then Ruth would have to be early on, I believe, in the time of the judges. Okay, so then let's just talk a little bit about, and the reason I say that is because this is just one generation, so that would be pretty close together. Okay, so let's think for a second of what we know about the time of the judges. What would characterize, like there's a phrase written throughout the book of Judges that characterizes what the time of the judges is, is like. And what is that? Everyone did what? What was right in their own sight. Right. Everyone did what was right in their own mind or sight. It depends on your translation. Okay, now a contrasting statement or a, an actual follow-up to this statement was it was right in their own eyes. I, that's what it is, not mine, it's eyes. Right in their own eyes or sight. But how did God view it? You didn't like it, right? It was evil in the sight of the Lord. Okay, so even though, so you've got these two statements throughout Ju uh, the book of Judges, and that is that every man did what was right in his own eyes, but in God's view of it, it was evil. It was evil in the sight of the Lord. So, and we also have this phrase, evil on the side of the Lord, over and over through the book of Kings, the two books of Kings and Chronicles. So um, just keep that in mind because that's the context of the book of Ruth, is it was during this time. Does, does that mean, when it says everyone, does it really mean like there's no, nobody that's righteous and no good? No, it's, 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 it's a generalized statement, um, but it, it, they weren't they weren't guided. They weren't following after God's ways overall. Okay, so now that we've got a broad context of the timeline of this and where it fits and what is going on during those times, let's start looking at the actual book of Ruth. So in chapter one, we have the, the, the closer context, which is where are they and why and who? Who, what, where, when, why? Who is where? Why are they there? When? We know the when, which is judge, the time of judges.
They were in the land of Moab. Okay, they being who? Um, Elimelech. Elimelech? Elim and Naomi, their two sons, Mahalon and Chilion. Right, so these four are in the land of Moab. Okay, so let's just stop and pause for a second. What do we know about Moab? Uh, they believed in idolatry. They had other gods and they had food. <laughs> okay, all right, that's significant because? They were going through a famine in, uh, in Bethlehem. Right. Um, so they had left, they being Elimelech and his family had left Bethlehem in the land of, of Judah and they had gone to Moab where, you know, like you said, very practically, there must have been food and they went there. Um, now, context of everyone did right in, the, in his own sight, do you think this is necessarily what God wanted them to do? Or could Elimelech have been leading his family? in doing what was right in his own eyes. Probably the second one, right? So, but it doesn't necessarily say that, but we wanna be able to put the, it tells us it's in the days of the judges. Now, Martha's absolutely right about that characterization of the land of Moab or the Moabites, but do we know where they came from? Do you know the origins of Moab? It takes you way back. If you go back to the book of Genesis, in the time of Abraham and Lot, Lot had go gone towards Sodom and Gomorrah, and then God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, and in the process, he rescued, through the two angels, he rescued Lot, Lot's wife, and Lot's two daughters. Now, there would have been more if anyone else had listened and gone with them, because certainly Lot at least tried to tell his two sons-in-law, or, or fiancés of his daughters, future sons-in-law, but they wouldn't listen to him. They thought he was crazy. So as they're leaving the town, the wife turns and looks back, turns into a pillar of salt, and Lot and his daughters go further away, go up to like a mountain or wherever, the daughters aren't like real clear thinkers. <laughs> and they decide one by one to get their father pre get their father drunk. And then they go and have relations, sexual relations with him and each of them get pregnant. It's gross. Let's just say what we mean about it. It's gross. One of them has, Mo a Mo has the son named Moab the other one has the son named Amnon. And so we have the sons of Amnon and we have the Moabites. That's where Moab came from, all right? Why is that significant? Lot's relationship to Abraham is that Lot was a nephew. So his daughters and then his son grandsons, gross, um, are also very closely related to Abraham. At this point, Abraham doesn't even have a son. And, and many of us look at it and think, did Abraham think that Lot was going to be his heir? But God made it clear that no, not Lot. It was going to come from Abraham himself. So, so that's where Moab comes from. Very closely related to the Israelites once the Israelites came along from Abraham. Now, fast forward to captivity in Egypt and the, then the Exodus, as they're wandering in the wilderness, and we just looked at this a little bit in Jude, this is gonna ring, hopefully ring a couple of bells, because during that Exodus, they had defeated, the Israelites had defeated a certain groups of people and started occupying their lands. And this king of Moab <laughs> gets very concerned and he hires a prophet named Balaam, do you remember this from Jude, to come and curse the Israelites. And every time Balaam opened his mouth, he ended up blessing them. But if, as we studied later, Balaam got a clue and he counseled the Moabites to entice through women mainly into their idol worship. And it was a way to trip up the Israelites. And God even created a plague. And one of, um, um, sorry, what's Abraham's brother? Um, 
Aaron. Aaron's sons killed threw a spear through them, two of them, and it stopped the plague. A lot of history to just give you an idea of the Moabites. And they wouldn't let the Israelites walk through their land. They wouldn't give them hospitality in the most basic way. And so God said of the Moabites that even to the 10th generation, they were not to be brought in, not to be able to participate in the temple worship later, in the tabernacle worship. They were, he was, he was not happy, not happy with them at all. Even to the 10th generation, it said. You look that up this week, right? Okay, where are we in generations here? I just told you from the time of Joshua to the time of Judges, where you've got Rahab and Salmon, and then you've got Ruth. And Boaz could be one generation. Let's say it's more than that. Let's say it's two, three generations, but it could be just one generation. And if it's just one generation, are we even close to the 10 generations? <laughs> no. So the people of Moab are not acceptable to God. They are, therefore, Elimelech and taking his family there, I don't believe he's in God's will to go there. It doesn't specifically say that, but it also just puts, we've got to understand the amazingness of this story and the mercy of God in all of this, that even though they, that a group of people had acted in a certain way and God had a certain statement about them, he looks at the individual. And we've always got to remember that and, and be grateful <laughs> that we were one of those individuals as well. So it's a lot of context, but it's really helpful to understand, you know, what, when Ruth was brought back to Israel, how, what would her reception have been? How would she have been viewed? What would she have to overcome? These are things to be thinking about. So in the first chapter, we have, as we've already said, Elimelech and Naomi, Chilean and Malan going to Moab and living there, I think it said for what, 10 years? Yeah, for about 10 years. It's a long time. The times of judges, when you read about them, you see that the people that after Joshua died, that the people didn't have that strong leader, they weren't following after someone, they were doing what was right in their own eyes, they had the truth. Don't, don't ever forget that. We're not excusing them and saying, well, they just didn't have. Yeah, they did. They, and it was supposed to be passed down. It was supposed to be taught. The scribes and the priests were supposed to be preserving it and passing it along. And God had made a covenant with them and they kept breaking it. But so you've got this group that leaves and goes to Moab because there was a famine in the land. I mean, it was a very practical thing. But notice when they come back, there are people that didn't leave. So did they have to leave? Maybe not. Would it have been tough? Yeah. As a result of leaving, you've got to also remember that when he was, when Elimelech was in Bethlehem, he would have been given an inheritance. And it would have been a greater inheritance at that point because there were fewer generations to have chiseled it down. So Elimelech would have had his own land. Did he sell it before he went? Or did it just lay fallow and nobody or somebody just took it over? That part is not real clear. But God said, never remove the ancient boundaries. So those, those inheritances were to be preserved. And that's a huge part of this story. So when they're in Moab, what happens to this family? Their her sons die. Right. And uh, then she wants to go back. Well, the husband has also died, but yes. She wants, now we also have to add in the husband, the son's married. So they four went, now they're six, now they're three. Right? So now we're down to the three women. We've got Naomi and who else? 
Oprah? It's Orpa, but yeah. And as, as a matter of fact, I think that's where Oprah got her name, but they misspelled it. But it's Orpa and Ruth. Ruth, right. Okay. Did you look up the names to know the what these names mean? Because it's, it's very interesting. When you look at the name Elimelech, the first two letters are L. That means God. And most of the time, in a lot of the naming within Israel, a, especially a man's name, would have kind of the infusion <laughs> of part of God's name. So if you've got like uh, Isaiah, the A-H is part of God's name, the Jehovah part, the Ah part. Um, you've got El Elimelech. So you've got the L. And his, so his name, did anybody look it up? Does anybody know? I'll tell you if you don't. When I looked it up, I found my God is sovereign or divine king. So Elimelech is, his name should have reminded Elimelech that God is sovereign. And we go back to this idea of doing right in your own eyes. Does anybody know what Naomi means? It means pleasant or pleasantness or agreeable. That's what Naomi means. And would you agree that that pretty much characterizes her? Yeah, that's kind of what you see throughout. Now she at one point changes her name to Mara, which is a form of the word Mary. And what does Mara mean? Bitter. Bitter, bitter. right. And whether she was bitter or whether she saw her situation as bitter and we can all become embittered by our bitter situation. Um, it's not quite clear, but it's still, she, no, I don't, nobody called her that. She was really just making a statement of things weren't so great and I'm in trouble. Malon and Chilion, do you know what they mean? Malon means sickly, diseased, and weak. Chilion means weakness, pining, consuming, wasting away, consumption. Who's going to name their grandkids that? <laughs> I don't even name my dog that. <laughs> but it also may indicate maybe they were born sickly. You know, maybe there was already a, uh, an indication of they weren't going to live long, but apparently they lived to adulthood enough to have married, but neither one of them had any children when they died. So they had not passed that on. Orpa means gazelle, or it's really referring to the neck. It can also mean hard, like stiff-necked, hard-necked, or double-minded. Did you kind of see that with Orpa? Like she was committed to going, but then she went back. She changed her mind. She changed her mind. Right. Ruth. Does anybody know what Ruth means? It has the idea of satiation or satisfaction, being satisfied. It means friendship, beauty, something worth seeing. Like that one, don't you? <laughs> I do. Both of my grandmother's middle name was Ruth. So it, it's kind of an old fashioned name in our view of today, but it, it has a beautiful, beautiful look and beautiful meaning. Okay. So um, it's, it's when we name like our children or when we name or when they named, especially in the time of Israel and you realize, or Israelites in the Old Testament, you realize that a lot of times God changed people's names and there was a significance in that. Um, but just, you, it's, I'm not sitting here saying that I can predict or I can make something it like name it, claim it just by naming my child something. But I do believe there's some seriousness and value in thinking that through. Um, like I wouldn't name my child after a demon or something like that, or a devil or something like that. But Okay, so in our story, as it continues, you've got these, these three men dying, the 
the boys were childless, the young, the, the sons were childless, but they were married. And so Naomi says, finds out, what does she find out about home, Israel and Bethlehem? What does she find out? What did she heard? The Lord was giving them food back home. Right. So she feels comfortable going back home. And so she decides to return to the land of her people. And what do her two daughters-in-law, we've kind of already mentioned this, but what did her two daughters-in-law decide? To go with her. At first, they were both going to go. And Naomi says, no, um, well, she doesn't advise it. It's not like no at emphatic, but she says no. And what is her reasoning? I mean, why is she telling them, I, like she says, if, you, if I go with me, I can't do what? What is she telling them she's, she's not going to be able to do? She can't have another child. Right. She can't have more sons. Number one, her husband's dead, but she can't have more sons to provide for them husbands now is that what you would have thought the answer was going to be if you're going somewhere and you were telling somebody not go with you is that what you would have told them this is very foreign to us but if you've ever studied this before or certainly this week as you looked at it why did she say this what is the principle what is the navarite rule here A brother would would marry and provide to carry on the family. Right. Um, absolutely. So um, now we see this in several stories. For instance, we see it in the story of Judah himself. He had three sons and the first one married um, Tamar and that son died. Actually, God killed him, but that son died. And then Judah gave Tamar as wife to the second son and that one died as well. And so the youngest was the third son was a little young at the time. And Judah said, wait until he's old enough. Now, again, this is really foreign to us. It's not the way we think, but it is, it wasn't just a rule. There was a reason behind this. And as, as you were saying, it was to provide and carry on the line. Now it wasn't just in that case, it wasn't just Judah's line that they were trying to carry on. It was to have a child in the name of that first son by the second son. And then it was to have a child in the name of e both of those sons. So it wasn't just to carry on Judah's name. It was to carry on those sons' names. And what is attached also to the fact that you would have a child to carry on that man's name, what came along with that? An inheritance. The, whatever the inheritance was going to be, including property, probably. So it's, it's practical and it makes sense. And yet it's not something and not the way we think. Um, I, we were watching some history stuff recently. And I don't know if you know this, uh, or if I might be reminding you of something, but King Henry VIII had an older brother. What was his name? can't think of his older, his older brother's name, who married uh, Catherine of Aragon, but died. And then Henry married her. So we even see this beyond the nation of Israel. We even see this um, in, that's not recent, but you know, a more recent historical setting. It's also Henry VIII turned that around later and said that, that that marriage should never have happened because he believes it violated scripture when he obviously didn't have a good grasp of scripture <laughs> because it didn't violate scripture, especially with his brother did. But it's, it's just not necessarily the way we think, but there was provision in it. And what Na Naomi was saying to them, these two women, is if you come with me, there's, I can't provide you with a son that you would end up marrying, especially two. I can't provide you with two sons for you to marry and, um, and then carry on the, the name of your first husbands 
therefore turn back and go to your people and I'll go home. Orpa turned back, but what did Ruth do? She stayed with her. And these verse, these words that Ruth says are extremely familiar to most of us, completely out of context, because they're usually used in a marriage ceremony between a woman and a man, instead of between a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law. But they're still beautiful words, and they still can be used and applied. It's just that the direct context is between Naomi and Ruth. But the wording and the way it is said, this commitment that Ruth makes to Naomi includes language that should be ringing some bells. It sounds like Ruth is making a covenant with Naomi because she says, I will not part from you except for through death. I will not leave you. This is a huge commitment. She also said her God will be her God. Yes. Um, that means that she, that Naomi has been a good witness and that uh, Ruth has, has, it looks like a conversion has happened or a proselyte has happened where uh, Ruth has let go of her Moabite ways and culture and embraced the one, the culture and the one God of Israel, the one true God. And, you know, these could just be words, except for we see it play out. So this is very true, Naomi and, uh, well, Ruth lives by this. So there, I believe, and in, in when you study covenant, you realize that when you enter, when I enter in covenant with, with Jesus and you enter in covenant with Jesus, we're in covenant with each other, you know, indirectly, but we're part of the family and we need to be able to see things that way and our churches and our world would be a whole lot better off if we did. <laughs> um, re reality is, if they're true believers, and if I'm a true believer, we're going to spend eternity together. We better get along now. Um, we don't do so hot on that. Okay, so Naomi goes back um, with Ruth back to Bethlehem, which is the city of David that David came from. Um, we know the story, uh, probably just remember it from this Christmas time during the census, where did um, Mary and Joseph go? Bethlehem, because that was the city of David. Um, David took on Jerusalem later and called that the city of David also, but this is the city of David's birth uh, later. So Mara, uh, she calls herself Mara. She tells the people back home and then they're, they're living there. And um, we bring up in chapter two, there is a new player on the stage, and that is Boaz. Okay, what do we know about Boaz? He's rich. He's very wealthy. He's, he's a, a man landowner. Yes, uh, he's a landowner. As we know, there's a harvest going on on this land. Uh, he's wealthy, as it tells us in verse one. Now, just remember the context when Elimelech and his family left, they left during a famine and stayed gone for 10 years. Now they've heard things are better and Naomi's come back. In the meantime, Boaz apparently stayed and Boaz is a wealthy man. So the obedience of staying led potentially to Boaz prospering in the land rather than what happened to Elimelech when he went away. Uh, they might've eaten, but that's about all that happened when they were gone. Okay, so um, the character of Ruth shows up in this chapter because Ruth does what during this chapter? Does she sit around? No, she goes to work. She goes to work, right. In his field. In his fields. Um, now again, sovereignty of God, it doesn't, and Naomi didn't send her to those fields. I mean, we don't see any words that say, go to this man's fields. In the sovereignty of God, she may have wandered from, from field to field, or she may have wandered right into this one, but the, uh, is it barley and wheat? I think it's barley harvest. One of the harvests is going on. I can't remember which one right now. Um, 
and but it would be important because I, I think it's the fall um but i may not be right about that but it, it would it would indicate the time of year but depending on which harvest it is and um so she goes and she works and the provision that God had made in the law for the poor people was that when anyone was harvesting a field, they were just supposed to round out the corners and leave the corners for the poor people to be able to harvest and, and, and come in and work. So this is workfare, not welfare. And remember, Jesus said over and over, the poor will always be with you. He wasn't dismissing them. He was just stating a fact. The poor will always be with you. When the poor are always with us, what does that give us the opportunity to do? To help them out. Right. To extend the love and grace of God and help them out. But God also made provision that they would go and they would work. And they would do it in such a way that this wealthy landowner was going to make enough off this harvest that he could leave this portion and let the poor people come and have food and have a way to get it, even if they might not have land and be able to do it themselves otherwise. So Ruth goes, now did, did Boaz just follow the letter of the law? I mean, he did follow the law. Did he follow the letter of the law or did he go above and beyond it? He went above because he protected her. Very good. Which I believe that just shows the character of the man. Um, she would have been extremely vulnerable and she would have been a disregarded person being from Moab. In other words, she would have been lesser than them. They would have considered her not, she, she was a Gentile. They would have not considered now she was married to an israelite so that probably helped a little bit but at this point she wasn't but um there's no indication she's treated badly at all i'm just saying you have to start thinking about what would this small town remember bethlehem is a small town really small town <laughs> really really small town where everybody would have known everyone really small town and so when Naomi came back, everybody would have known about it. Everybody would have known about Ruth. But Ruth is already showing her character and it shows up in the description of her in this chapter and throughout this book. When people talk about her, they talk about her in glowing terms. And Boaz, as Martha was saying, takes it upon himself to protect her. If she stays with his farm, and his workers and he tells his servants you don't touch her and he tells her to you know stay in the safety so that's going above and beyond it was more than just the corners of the field she was able to reap among the sheaves she was able to take grain from what they were harvesting not what they left over so it was even more and we see that boaz make sure she gets something to eat and make sure she's protected as we've already said and then make sure she goes home with not just for her but for Naomi as well. So Boaz goes really way beyond what he has to do which is awesome but it also he's capable. This is this is he's a wealthy man. This is something he's capable of doing. It's already said that he is a close relative when you looked up the words for close relative and relative and kinsman and all of that, there are different Hebrew words used, but the one for closest relative is the same root, geal, for kinsman redeemer, for this idea of this verb actually of redeeming. Um, when you look up kinsman, it's a noun. And it just means a relative, a male relative. Um, well, I don't know if it says it's a masculine noun. Then you've got relative, which is an adjective, meaning near or close by, closely related. And then you've got the closest relative, which is actually a verb, meaning um, to redeem or act as a kinsman redeemer, to buy back out of bondage. It's this idea. Okay. So, um, and we've looked at the Leviticus law already. Um, 
she calls, you know, the relationship with Naomi and Ruth keeps being um, shown to us over and over throughout this. And when I told you before, Naomi means pleasant and Ruth means friendship. Look at putting them together. This is a pleasant friendship. And I don't know if you know this, but the word friend is a covenant term. It's what God called Abraham. Later, it's what Jesus calls us. Remember, he says, I no longer call you slaves, but I call you friend. Um, we need to look at that word and realize that we cannot use it when we're talking about an unbeliever. If you're a believer, you really can't have a friend who's an unbeliever. And I'm, I'm taking that word very literally. We can have close associations. We can be very friendly. We can even love um, and have love for someone who is, an, it could be a family member even, that is an unbeliever. But we cannot have a covenant relationship. That's where the New Testament tells us not to be unequally yoked. It's not just talking about marriage. It's talking about our associations. I was going to say friendships. Our associations, our business alliances, you know, and all kinds of things. I'm not saying don't be friendly because we need to be friendly in this world and we need to reach out to the unbelievers. But close associations can only be had, those true bonded associations can only be had with other believers or we're unequally yoked and it's going to end up causing problems. So, um, so anyway, we see the story and then Ruth goes, um, she goes back to Naomi with the food, tells her how her day went and Naomi understands what's going on. Naomi gets a clue. Then she instructs Ruth. And she tells Ruth to do certain things that are really weird. Um, but, and it seems a little manipulative, but it really isn't. Uh, don't think of it that way. Uh, so what, what ends up happening? Does anybody want to tell the story? They, I know Ruth goes to where they're harvesting as Naomi tells her to do. And what does she do? When, what, who's she looking for and what does she do? We're in chapter three, if you're wondering. Her mother, her mother-in-law told her to go and, and uh, lie at his feet. Right. Notice she says lay at his feet. She does not say spoon him. <laughs> or, you know, you know, she does not, she's not telling Ruth to go and have sexual relations with him. Because that has been suggested. That is not what's going on here. And she also, said, what? And also, she tells her to pretty herself up. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can imagine being out in the barley harvest and all the stuff that's flying through the air and the dirt that's kicked up and everything else and sweat. Um, you'd probably, probably get pretty grimy. Um, and so, yeah, I would say that's not a bad idea. <laughs> Clean up, make yourself pretty, put on some nice clothes and then go. And you're supposed to watch to see where Boaz was going to lay down. So there is an opportunity here. We're not talking manipulation. We're talking about an opportunity. And in going and laying down at his feet, at some point he moved his feet and he noticed that she was there and he sits up. It's dark, you know, semi-dark, whatever. And he asks, you know, like finds out who it is. She identifies herself and asks him to do what? It's in verse nine, spread your covering over your maid for you are a close relative. Okay, we had to go to Ezekiel to kind of understand this because it's not part of our understanding and culture. But in Ezekiel, there's the picture of God doing this with the nation of Israel. That God found Israel and God threw his covering or his skirt, it even says, over the nation of Israel. This is the picture of marriage. This is basically Ruth proposing <laughs> or asking for him to propose. 
she's offering herself as a potential spouse. Now he's got the opportunity to say no. She has not really compromised herself. Um, although he even takes measures to make sure she hasn't compromised herself by sending her away before anybody sees that she's there. So that there would be no suspicion of that or that anything improper had happened. But she calls him a close relative and he responds and his response is so interesting because he said, blessed, may you be blessed of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown the last kindness to be better than the first by not going after young men, whether poor or rich. So this kind of indicates he's not a young man. And she could have looked elsewhere. But instead, she saw his character, and Naomi did too, and saw also Naomi understood he's a close relative. He could marry you and, and be your redeemer in the situation, be that, that man that could marry you and redeem your property. But he says he's aware. I think he's thought about this, to be honest with you. But he's aware that while he's a close relative, he's not the closest relative. So he said, go home and I'll go and talk to the closest relative. If he'll redeem you, that's fine. If he won't, I will. So they're, they're safe. They're comfortable. They're going to be okay because Boaz is stepping up. Now, if, you ever, if you've never seen any of this before, if you've never studied any of this before, this is really weird and very foreign. But again, it goes back to that idea of that if you don't have a brother, then you go to the closest relative to do the same thing that a brother would do if a brother dies, he would marry the wife. There's a lot of provision in this. So in this, Naomi suggests all of this, Ruth goes and carries it out. I'm not sure Ruth really understood all of it. Maybe Naomi did a good job of explaining it. We just don't have that text. But as it plays out, Boaz knew exactly what was going on and did not cover her yet because there's someone else that he has to go see first. Boaz would have been wrong at this point if he had just taken her as wife. So Boaz sits by the gate, waits for that closest relative to come and presents the opportunity to him. And what's the reaction of that man? When Boaz says, hey, Naomi's back, Ruth is with her, and you are the closest relative, and you can redeem their property. What does the guy say? He said, no, thanks. He said, yes, first. Yes, first? Oh, okay. yeah. He said, yes, first, until Boaz added in. Ruth went with it. Exactly. <laughs> Ruth goes with it. He said, no, thanks. And then he said, no, thanks. And his response includes that he would risk his own inheritance in doing it, um, which okay, um, we don't really fully get. I don't know what the risk was. Maybe he was already married. Maybe there was, it wasn't apparently the buying of the property because he agreed to that part. It was the marrying Ruth that was the bad part. So in some way, and we don't really know what way, he understood that in marrying Ruth, he would risk his own inheritance. Um, and he didn't want to do that. So he gave it over to Boaz. And there was usually this ceremony of taking off your shoe and handing it to the other person and, you know, all of this, where um, they, um, it, it would have been seen among the other elders sitting there at the gate, because most decisions were made there. If you needed a judgment on something, if there were city businesses that needed to be discussed, the men of the city, the elders of the city would sit at the gate and that's where these things would be discussed. And so this would be witnessed. And, um, and then, you know, so he says to the elders and the people that are there, you are witnesses today that I have bought from the hand of Naomi, all that belong to Elimelech and all that Elimelech, sorry, and all that belong to Chilean and Malon. 
And moreover, I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, Malon, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance so that the name of the deceased may not be cut off from among his brothers or from the court of his birthplace. You are witnesses today. Now, they got married. They had a child. And there's more to a little bit more to this. But just think of that child. And that child's name was Obed. And so from Ruth and Boaz, you get Obed. While he was Boaz and Ruth's son, and that never changed, the text actually tells you he becomes Naomi's son in the sense that he is being raised up to replace Naomi's son, Malan, on his inheritance and his name is preserved. Now, he's not called Malan. That's not the type of name to be preserved. It's the line on the land. So if Ruth and Boaz had further children, there would have been a difference made. It was just this first one to preserve, preserve Elimelech's line and to preserve one of his son's line, which is Malon. Again, this is very foreign thinking to us, but that's the way this plays out. And the provision in it is incredible. And we can, we're going to have two more weeks to understand this even better as we go on. But even in verse 15 or verse 14 and 15, it says the blessings from the people said, blessed is the Lord who has not left you, Naomi, you without a redeemer today. And may his name become famous in Israel, the name of Obed to become famous in Israel. May he also be to you a restorer of life and a, a sustainer of your old age for your daughter-in-law loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. That's just a phrase, better than you seven sons. It's like they can't even imagine that. Um, then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the neighbor women gave him the name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. So they named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. So Obed to Jesse to David. Again, some scholars believe there are uh, left out generations, but it's quite possible people were living over a hundred years back then. Joshua, I think, lived to be 110. So it's possible that these people lived these long in a generation might be 100 years long, for instance. Um, and then it gives the generations and it says these are the generations of Perez. To Perez was born Hezron, Hezron, Ram, Ram, Amenadab, Amenadab, Nashon, Nashon, Salmon, Salmon was born Boaz, Boaz, Obed, Obed, Jesse, Jesse, David. Um, so it gives that genealogy of Christ. And you see two women that are not of the nation of Israel that should not be in this line that are all part of the line of, of David, the line of ultimately Jesus. Uh, God's redemptive nature is seen in all of this. And there's so much hope for all of us. Because guess what? We're Gentiles. And it's really great to see that 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 even though people groups that were not that were far off as what Paul says, we were far off and we have been brought near and been brought into that covenant. And in so doing, we've been brought into the body with the Jews. And we are fellow heirs, fellow heirs with Christ and all But we've got. Boaz doing the right thing, not doing right in his own eyes, as in the days of Judges. So you have that anomaly. And then you also have Ruth, who's not acting like a Moabitess. She has converted and taken on the God of the Israelites. And therefore, she is acceptable in that sense, but also her character and her ways. And Boaz accepts this responsibility gladly. I believe this is a love story. I don't believe it's a story of just, you know, doing what you have to do. I think it's a beautiful story. So, and it all takes place, not all, this part takes place in Bethlehem of 
Bethlehem Ephrathra, which is there's different Bethlehems in Israel. So this one is specific. This is the one that David was born in. And this is the one that ultimately Jesus was born in. So little bitty town, <laughs> so insignificant not far, I forgot how many miles, but a few miles, like something like seven or eight miles outside of Jerusalem, tiny little suburb, and um, so much of importance going on there. So um, it's a wonderful story. And if all we did was look at these four chapters right now and be done, it is still an amazing, amazing story. But we got two more weeks to look at this that much more and to learn more and more and more about this idea of being redeemed and having that kinsman redeemer and who ultimately is our kinsman redeemer. Jesus. Jesus. Yes. It's a beautiful picture in this, even though it's flawed and has human parts to it. Jesus fulfilled it perfectly. But even in this, there's just a beautiful picture. So we will stop for now. And for those that want to stay for the video, we'll take our break and come back and um, watch the video. Uh, next week, we'll discuss lesson two. Right now, I don't know if anything that's going to cause any breaks, but I'll let you know. I try to let you know plenty of time in advance. Um, I don't see anything on my calendar yet, but, you know, something can come up. Uh, otherwise, we'll go through these three. If you haven't already gotten your first Corinthians book, I would suggest you go ahead and get that because that's coming up in just two weeks. Uh, we'll, we'll be done with this in two weeks and then we'll start uh, first Corinthians right after that, um, pretty much. Um, so anybody have anything else they want to add that I didn't cover or a question you might have had? OK, well, we'll end this in prayer. And then again, if you need to leave, that's fine. And then we'll do the video briefly. Gracious Heavenly Father, this is one of the most beautiful stories um, of all. I just love it. And I love the fact that you have preserved it and provided it for us. And that it isn't just a story, as we would say, like a novel, a fiction. It is definitely not. It is a beautiful nonfiction story and an account of things that are just so foreign to us but the provision is so beautiful. The, um, the thought out process that you have given through the law long before this and all the way long after this through Christ and now even long after that to us that we do have this kinsman redeemer, that we have this ability to know that we have a, an inheritance, even if it's not this earth necessarily, but that we have this relationship with you and our, in the family of God and that you have redeemed us and that we are part of that family and that we're alongside of others and we're alongside of Jews and Gentiles together in the same body, having that wall broken down and being brought together. We love all of this, Father, and the reminders of it, but we just thank you for it. Thank you for our time together. Take us into next week as we do the next part of our study and as we prepare to do to change from this one to 1 Corinthians. So we thank you for it all and ask for it all in Jesus' name and for his sake as well. Amen.